Yes. Let's start talking about vision transformers, right? And before we do that, I want to sort of get into CNNs versus transformers. So who here knows about CNNs? Cool. Most of us, right? So let me just do a very quick recap, right? CNNs, convolutional filters, uh, they're sequential, they're successive computation, and uh, there's a local window, and you're basically, uh, to get any large range dependencies, you require a lot of layers, correct? Uh, and the most important thing that I want to concentrate on is that the convolutional layers are static, right? As opposed to self-attention, right? Self-attention is also sequential, uh, but I think the most important part here is that it covers long range dependencies, right? Uh, and uh, the key difference is uh, it has no inductive bias towards locality. So this is all supposed to be learned by the transformer, right? Uh, and so basic difference between CNNs and transformers, they're learned weights in CNNs, and uh, whereas the weights in transformers are produced by the attention vectors. Make sense? Okay, cool. Now let's talk about replacing these CNNs with self-attention, right? So you have basic convolution layer. Let's take like a region CNN, for example. You take the image, you do segmentation to no regions, run CNNs over that. You have an input. You learn static parameters looking for a pattern. And uh, I know we mostly learn about CNNs as so sort of like kernel uh, mapping, right? But uh, think of it as like contextualizing, right? So you're contextualizing one pixel based on its nearby pixels, and then you take that area, and then you keep on building that up, right? Whereas uh, in a vision transformer, uh, you also do contextualization, but it's, uh, it's more so like a query. So like, okay, so one, each pixel here is a query, right? And the keys of that, uh, uh, the neighboring pixels around it are the context, right? Uh, and I'm basically asking, am I really similar to my neighbors? Or is there any info in the neighbors that is relevant to my meaning? Now, some architectures call these uh, neighbors a memory block as well. And what you get is an output, which is pixel contextualized by its neighbors. And you, again, build on top of that. Right. Uh, so yeah, uh, you do some vertex multiplication, you get softmax. So the thing we're trying to get is how well the query matches the keys, right? How well the pixel matches its neighbors and, uh, doing this for every pixel wouldn't fit on the GPU. So the local attention layer is, uh, what you build up. And so one very, uh, key difference is. When you're sort of doing convolution, even though uh, this looks a lot more fancy when you're doing self-attention, over time, uh, CNNs, because they have fixed weights, they increase spatially, whereas transformers don't so much depend on the spatial context. So these are actually more parameter efficient. Cool. Uh, and yeah, so pixel contextual neighbors, how do you, but okay, one thing that's missing, right, is CNNs, it already have like the locality there, but the positioning in transformers is not present in this structure that I've given. So what do you do? You just take relative positioning, right? Uh, and uh, so positional embeddings are added to the key and they will be, uh, so unlike language transformers, here it's everything's related, right? So for a given query, it's positioning embedding of a pixel uh, for a given query changes. And that's the only other like key aspect differing from language. Uh, and so, yeah, this, I mean, the positioning for a pixel to pixel basis may not make much sense, but think of it as objects, right? An object is positioned across different objects. So that's what it happens, right? Uh, okay, cool. So let's now talk about vision transform. So vision transformers are the input is an image, right? And I arbitrarily take the image and slice it in uh, patches. Now, why I use the word arbitrary professor also likes to use this is because this is a hyperparameter, right? 
i can sort of take different orderings and divide it in this particular case uh you sort of have 16 by 16 of a 256 by 256 image uh so you patch it up and uh here what you end up doing is basically uh patch it right uh add position embeddings uh put it in a transformer encoder and the basic rule is uh you want to have two kinds of losses one is to learn the position of the patch right given a uh, like let's say you mask a patch out where is that patch relative to the others right and uh, this is an architecture uh, substitute for resnet but in like a transformer setting and the, there is no inductive bias here except the patching right that's the disjoint patches now uh, you also learn positional embeddings and then what you can sort of do on top is you flatten the image patches 16 by 16 uh you have the embedding for the whole image and then you can sort of use like the basic image net classes to do some kind of supervision uh like some kind of super uh, like to learn a classifier on top of it for example right and uh yeah then uh so these are a couple of curves basically showing that this is uh, more compute efficient right so what they've done is they've taken three models they've taken a vit they've taken a resnet like model and they did sort of hybrid and so if you sort of just look on the curves the transformers above resnet right and the hybrid in the case cuz they just kind of mix the two structures uh have like is more compute efficient and if you look over time resnet does catch up to it like some uh like if you train it a, a longer uh but the key factor here is vit is more compute efficient which means with reduced number of parameters it uh performs equally if not better right uh uh and then yeah uh, parameters versus accuracy you can sort of see the full attention is closer to c sum attention so far all good cool uh now another thing is that this vit uh, structure also does learn some resnet like things right uh, they run like filter operations that you've probably seen in some kind of cnn architectures if you do a pca and all of that stuff and also uh, it does uh, have some facial structure to it right uh, if you see here this like sort of zoom out a lot then it's you can see towards the edges this pixel is not related to the end pixels it's more related to the ones in the middle you sort of see that over a wide range right uh, another thing is uh, if you look at the attention distance here uh, this is a very weird graph but uh, if you look at the attention distance uh, you can see that vit structures sort of have more spatial awareness than a cnn sort of model where essentially you can uh, basically convolution layers are they only have a local neighbor right so here uh, the spatial regions uh, are much larger because you're not restricted by a local window cool all right uh, now uh, i know some of you are considering couple of resnet like slash whatever architectures for your projects but uh, is this like objectively just better vit well uh, if you look by this graph you can completely make out right what is the best model to use uh but no like essentially it depends right uh they're very similar in terms of performance across different categories where some perform better some uh, don't uh what, one thing i would say is uh basically they're pretty comparable uh if you're choosing one for your projects pick the one that's easiest to use uh and like have a reasonable justification for it uh but another key thing that uh i wanted to mention was that if you look at these sort of models right uh what's happening over here what's happening is there is uh you're trying to predict right so uh there's some class uh there's some classification or some kind of task that you're doing downstream right so let's say i am a person and i'm just like standing over here 
and the label is am i a person or not well if i just erase my facial features that model will still be able to perform well right does that make sense so essentially what i'm saying is uh you're missing the subtleties because you're concentrating on a task which is is this a person is this a phone whatever right and that turns out to be a uh, harmful later down the line because essentially if i start playing adversarially uh then like if i have if i add wrong examples you're not basically learning a lot of interesting things about a particular object right uh you're not learning the intricacies of hands or whatever because you're focusing more on the classification or like understanding sort of task so essentially it's really good at predicting task labels but uh it it it's very task focused so the next models we're sort of going to see are ones to address this so uh one uh, way of do addressing this is by sort of having a generative loss right so where we're trying to it's harder to train obviously but it adds more uh, it brings back the subtlety so one example is what they use in the dali paper so basically uh they have uh they try to take this image and uh map it to uh basically a code book of similar vectors and once you have the image you sort of map uh you sort of like snap it the vectors in the middle to the code book of vectors and then once you have that code book uh you try to get back in right so like you see like i've tried to take this image i map it to an embedding space of like a uh, vectors that are like called visual token right that i can like map by numbers to and then i got that and i try to transform it back into an image uh and as you can see because we have a lim like limited embedding space right we're talking about uh, a code book of vectors uh you lose some information here right uh and then uh especially if you've seen like the dali papers where you lose most information is text so if you can see like i have la gram patisserie it becomes whatever right and you could say that this is one of the reasons why uh dali esque papers are not very great at generating text like when this paper came out and since then they've sort of tried improving upon it uh but uh one way of uh, again looking at the similar visual token style is basically having a uh to tokenize these images right so take the original image make them image patches uh and then uh essentially first you learn the codes that reconstruct the pixels and then you learn a bert model that reconstructs the code from the pixel so block wise mask it flatten it uh predict the visual tokens and then from the visual tokens reconstruct the image right does that make sense yeah so the code book is essentially like their discrete clusters so you're sort of like mapping it to a like an embedding space sort of think of it that way um so you take a code book of similar vectors and you're kind of clustering them into like hey Th it this looks sim more similar to this vector this looks more similar to this vector and you're sort of mapping it uh dali paper like explains in the detail but yeah basic um and yeah so here uh you have two encoders right uh one is just trying to find the visual tokens and then later on uh you kind of reconstruct the image uh so this sort of seems good but as especially like text um so what can we do uh well one idea is to get rid of the entire concept of a visual token right why not just produce pixels directly and uh this is similar to what we do in like a bot like model where we mask certain things and try to predict them but in a vision setting you're not masking like 10% or 20% you're going to be masking like 70% of the image uh so 
like a mask a random subset 70 why 70 well uh, it's sort of counter intuitive reasoning but if you just hide uh, hide a subset of the neighbors well it tries to do it like t- tries to, the model tries to take a shortcut right and it thinks very local so you you're like okay just you know what remove 70% of the image right and uh, you have this encoder uh, which is uh, vit uh, sort of encoder and then uh, you encode whatever is left so let's say the 30% of images into this uh, h vector and because you have the positional embeddings you sort of put the vectors uh, where they would be placed within the image right uh, and then given the decoder you train it to get back the rest of the image uh from going back from edge back to the patches so this is uh you have like an auto encoder reconstruction kind of loss and you try to recreate every single detail here and what's interesting is that once you do it so this is only used during training right like okay i've trained it now uh for our tasks based things we we'll just take the entire input or whatever input we're giving and we won't have to mask it so this is only used for training purposes where you're masking like 70% and decoding it but uh during test time you can just take the entire image and then encode it using whatever the uh, like this architecture so essentially now what we're trying to do is we're capturing the subtlety that was missing from like a vit does that make sense cool uh and yeah reconstruction loss over the whole image and uh well you might be wondering hey is this masking ratio even doing something good well it it is like as you increase the masking ratio the performance actually gets better and uh you can see even for like uh in the paper even for like 90% kind of cases it reconstructs a lot of the image so if you can see here like that's uh, what we had input after training of it a bit this is what it generated but after training it a lot like it's doing very well yeah uh, isn't that kind of a problem when you're sort of memorizing the image at this point yes so uh, one a uh, big uh, like it's a very open ended question if it's like sort of overfitting over the class but if imagine if you're cl- like image sizes are really really large right like so i mean as in the data set sizes are really large then like it's so it is an open question where whether it's like it, so it could lead to hallucination kind of uh, objectives or some technically create a membership inference at that scale yeah yeah uh, the there are the great papers on this very thing that you mentioned uh but yeah how much are they overfitting is like one of the largest questions on these kind of models uh but okay that was a bit about the models uh before i jump into adding language to this are there any questions cool so now let's add language to these transform architectures uh to the vision architectures so uh how do we do that right uh so you can sort of have your region features right so uh you kind of saw image to cnn and then you had grid feature the like image to cnn and then now only recently have we sort of learned a transformer based thing which is image to linear embedding now why do we call a transformer linear embedding well at its base you're basically linear embedding and then you add text uh that goes through another transformer type architecture and then you interact the modalities so that's the overarching structure and so for example a uh, bird plus vit would fall within this architecture and depending on the size of the embeddings and size of the modality interaction you actually have quite a bit of uh, action so like for example your visual embedding could be much larger uh, your uh, visual embedding and text embedding is the same so something like clip where you're basically sort of having a reconstruction uh so you want it to be like of similar uh size uh in a wilt kind of setting where majority of the work is happening is actually 
the visual I'm adding and the text I'm adding, it's not that big, big but like the modality interaction is bigger. Uh, Alex Mert, I think you've learned this, right? Uh, have you yet? Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, but in a very high level, like yeah, the visual embedding is uh, like the it's cross model transformer. Transformer looks at the relationship between objects, and uh, so like yeah, the visual embedding is sort of larger. And if you see here, uh, in terms of running time, uh, built actually is much much faster uh, while having like similar performances. So. Uh, this yeah so that depends right uh, so like we're not just saying hey this is a transformer we're, we're saying like what is that modality interaction and like yeah these are not very accurate but like sort of explaining where the majority of the work is going right so in like a built, for example, the interaction is lower, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're going to be covering a bunch of models now uh, and how these models sort of look are along the lines of dash architecture plus BERT, right? So you have Dieter. So Dieter is, uh, so this, this is just a, right now it's just a like vision uh, kind of model where basically use CNN features. I get uh, a sequence to sequence model to predict object bounding boxes and the decoder inputs are like a small set of object query vectors. So like you get bounding boxes for these, uh, for these seagulls. Yeah. Seagulls. And so, so you have visual features produced by CNNs sequence to sequence model on top of the visual features to predict bounding boxes. Sure. Makes sense. Now, what happens in a multimodal setting? Uh, you have Ember. So what Ember does is it concatenates the text and the vision representation into the encoder, right? So if you see here, you have both that concatenated into the encoder. And then even the decoder, it takes in a fixed number of object queries, which are passed from the text, like, hey, how many objects do we have? Well, I have a cat, I have a white balls, I have a fence, a yellow tree. Okay. Those are the no, amount of object classes that I need to decode uh, and basically predict locations for each object. Now, where this model is cool and one of the cool results in the paper that they discussed is that because you added text to this, you can actually distinguish between a pink and a blue elephant without seeing examples of a pink or a blue elephant. So essentially the text sort of captures uh, like what a pink elephant or a blue elephant can be. Uh, and so there's a structured way of object detection. You know the number of objects to detect. Uh, that's sort of CNN plus BERT. So like it's, I'm not just saying like, hey, use transformers only, CNN models plus BERT models also exist. Okay, now let's see BERT. Now this is very much VIT plus BERT, right? So what happens is uh, you have the VIT kind of structure. You have a linear projection of flattened patches, uh, and then you add the word embeddings. And you sort of mentioned what modality it is, right? So is, is it language or is it text? And you can sort of think of this as opposite of inserting images into the language space. You're sort of inserting language into the vision space. And uh, uh, one thing, one key thing that they did in this particular paper was that they initialized this with uh, uh, with VIT. Uh, so essentially, uh, like it was pre-trained to predict objects, and then they inserted text into it. Uh, the word embedding, sorry. And uh, you do optimal transport to sort of understand word patch alignment and uh, here, one of uh, one thing that that's important, like, and you sort of have mass language modeling, uh, image text matching, all of that. They actually also tried to mask. Yeah. How do they ensure like the input pages are shared, right? So yeah. Uh, 
sorry uh, so Oh, so these are paired, right? So uh, you're given the pairing, and uh, essentially you are doing patch alignment. The bird, uh, so like this is, yeah. Uh, you could sort of do it the other way around, where you start with like pre-trained bird, but they started with pre-trained bit. They found pre-trained bird wasn't that uh, work that well. So yeah, that's how you get that. That's a good question. Uh, and uh, so they did mask language modeling. They did MS text up, but it didn't help. Uh, particularly because uh, they had to, uh, it was running on a pre-trained model. So like that's one of their interesting things. And if you can see here, uh, what's sort of happening is that, uh, okay, in terms of fusion, where would you put this model? Any idea? No, this is very early fusion, right? Yeah, because you've pre-trained uh, with the image labels and you're just adding text and matching it to this thing. So this is like early fusion kind of task. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and so this is a good option if you're, uh, if you're okay with like objects mixing and stuff uh, because this is very early fusion. Uh, cool. And the point between alignment between modalities, it actually does really well. Uh, so, I mean, it's not exactly accurate, but if you can see a uh, room with a rug, the attention on the rug is pretty much there. Chair especially is really good uh, where they get it. And you can sort of see it falters around, like I guess, cloud and other places and painting. It sort of assumes that the flower is also painting, but it's doing pretty well. Um, and if you look at, uh, inference, it is, uh, roughly comparable to like other LX, uh, Mert, Uniter, and all of these in terms of, uh, quality while running faster. So, uh, yeah, Wilt is a pretty good model, but now let's talk about Albef, right? Albef is also very similar, uh, where you're essentially um have like uh image ma uh, it, so itm is uh, mass language modeling itm is image text matching and you can sort of see like uh there's the image input with bert like there's the text input which uh, so image input which is a vit like text input which is uh like bert and there's an alignment that's sort of happening which is like clip type alignment um and uh it has a bunch of hard negatives. So does image match the text? Uh, if it's not in its, uh, its frame of reference, just no and yes questions. Um, one interesting thing that they do here is that, uh, if the mutual information is low between the image and the text, they focus on those examples more from a loss perspective. So they're saying, Hey, there's a hard negative of image and text pairs that don't match. So ignore, like that's yes or no boundary. But if it's really hard to see the mutual information between two things and they're actually matching, well, focus on those examples more from a loss perspective. So align before fusion, uh, again, like early sort of, uh, things, uh, BERT plus VIT plus like a clipish architecture. Cool. Uh, Close alignment. Yeah, it's hard negatives. All right. Uh, now, the next model we're going to cover is from an MAE perspective. So you saw CNN plus BERT. You saw uh, VIT, VI, uh, VIT plus BERT. Now let's look at MAE plus BERT. And what's really cool about this particular thing is this uh, model was made by a CMU uh, prof, like a team with the CMU prof that was teaching multimodal. So that's pretty cool. Uh, like he taught last semester, Yonatan Wisk, and like he worked on this particular model. And the aim in this model was uh, to get rid of the strong bias towards objects. So uh, in uh, so if you remember uh, Wilt, it was pre-trained on the object classes, right? And here the majority of the focus was 
uh, hey, you know what? We're gonna re- get rid of the strong bias. So what what do you end up doing? You just add language to Pixel MA, and uh, we don't initialize the model with op- with the object detection sort of model, and uh, this is in uh, like in terms of just what's happening, you can sort of see that this is very, very similar to VIT. Uh, the main thing is you've replaced this with an MAE and uh, you haven't pre-trained on object recognition. But, okay, how good is this particular model? Uh, it is, turns out, it does solve some of the issues that VIT had. Uh, so, uh, here, if you look at, where, uh, sorry, the, well, my bad, I've been using VIT. Uh, well, uh, so you had built supervised with ImageNet and you have VLC. If you see for the uh, for the thing which says a pitcher with, uh, at a baseball game who has just thrown the ball. Well, ImageNet doesn't have a thrown class. So where its attention is focused, is actually just a random pixel. Whereas, because we were using the MAE model underneath in our VLC, it does pretty well. It uh, There's no bounding box, there's no class supervision, and it recognizes that throw is referring to this action, perhaps, of this pitcher throwing a ball. And uh, so in this uh, particular case, uh, you have built bottleneck by objects in the image net that are targets for classification. So if you, uh, like we were discussing like 20, uh, 15, 20 minutes ago, that it's very bound by the task, right? Whereas in an MAE setting, what happens is you are, because you're reconstructing, uh, you are not very ta- ta- bound or ta- task bound. And essentially you're, learning the subtleties more. Um, and similar to this, a uh, person on a beach holding a kite string and a kite is in the air. So ImageNet probably, I think, has a kite uh, kind of variable, right? Uh, uh, sorry, class. So even for kite string, the attention is on the kite. Whereas for VLC, uh, the attention is on the string. So that's just a few uh, things that VLC was doing. And uh, if you look at the model behavior, uh, you can see that VLC has a, a better performance in terms of image retrieval. Uh, whereas in terms of just VQA kind of tasks, uh, ImageNet, uh, has a lot of classes. So VQA, both the models are pretty much comparable. Any questions so far? Cool. Now um, let's jump into video transformers. And the way video transformers work is essentially, we're gonna cover a few video transformers, but we're gonna focus more on the CNN based kind of things. Since then, uh, the architectures have moved towards a lot more employing transformers. Uh, but these are very common and great data sets that I think some of you have also mentioned in your project proposals. So you have the How 200 benchmark data set, which is basically multimodal in the setting of like, hey, cut word. How do you cut word? And it has captions, it has video. Uh, and these are, uh, it has a bunch of food and entertainment, home, garden, grass, computer, electronics, whatever. And, uh, what's important here is that these are weakly aligned, right? I'm not mapping, uh, if I'm, let's say talking about, Hey, switch on your phone. Uh, my action of switching on the phone doesn't directly correspond with switching on the phone. Like you need to, these are not mapped other than the timestamp where I said the word switch on the phone and then uh, how I switch on the phone. Does that make sense? Weak alignment. Cool. Uh, 
so uh, the goal is to learn better visual representations by taking advantage of large scale video and language resources uh so you have instructionally instructional videos uh so this is weekly pair data because essentially uh as you're talking about particular instructions it's turning into a much thicker mixture is not directly uh, related to i mean it's related to the video but not it's not the exact action that's sort of happening similarly to the biggest mistake is not needing it enough that particular text may not is is paired with the video data but it's not one to one right so what actually happens is your loss becomes kind of interesting so if you have a data point uh, which is let's say a short 3.2 second clip uh with a small number of words then um you have some positive candidates right within a context again hyperparameter can tune can check how it works but essentially what you're saying is sander as you would like to go over this wide area be as flat as you would like it so if you're just doing a particular frame or a particular video uh like clip and you're just looking at that particular text at that time that may not align directly right it, it may be a uh, slightly above and slightly beyond so it's weakly aligned so you can't really have um it, it, it's not like data that is like 100% accurate but what what you do know is, with like uh, the bias that we're using is within that context one of them is true so in these five examples one of them is a positive candidate of what's actually happening in the image slash video uh so how do you align uh, handle this misalignment because it's not one to one well you do multi instance learning which is basically the objective functions becomes out of all the caption in the space of the image we may not know which one is the right caption but we know that at least one of them is the right caption that's like the main technique here and because we don't have particularly uh, we don't have particular labels we're doing it in a self supervised way we add contrastive learning loss uh with positive and negative pairs so the negative pairs is anything not within the context of the video like uh, within like this uh second clip and whatever we decide the context is so that's a hard negative like 1 and 0 but within the context of the clip uh we use the multi instance learning objective of one of them is true make sense cool uh and yeah uh contrast learning and another approach for weakly paired video data is a uh, video bot and here you have one of tokens you've masked out video sections you've masked out language sections um again these sort of use uh, cnn based architectures overall but i'm pretty sure there's been literature since that has replaced these with transformers and what you end up doing is uh how do you get the visual words now well you do k mean clustering so you take the cluster you cluster these take the centroid of the k mean cluster as the representative for that particular video of what text and what uh input is that uh another thing that someone did was called actbot uh it's very similar to visual bot but if you can guess by act here it basically is doing regular bot uh plus frames so same as visual bot plus spatial position encoding so what i mean by that is you have some kind of embedding of like hey this is this far from camera this is this close so you have that kind of spatial position encoding and then you have uh so okay if you're doing cnns for images what's the what do you call that um uh, essentially what how how what dimension is cnn for images
just have one image and you're taking a cnn on top of it 2d right so what you can imagine for uh, videos what are you doing you have a 3d cnn right um uh, and uh, one of the techniques i think they use is i3d and so you have globally so yeah you have mass object classification and another thing that you have is mass action classification so you identify within the text corpus action words and you want to figure out what action that is and this is sort of like uh like like essentially you do verb masking instead of just random word masking and that's sort of adding like some weak noisy supervision to the overall model so that you're more focused on the actions that are happening here and uh yeah uh, so you have globally stacked frames this sort of is like a 3d cnn and you have some visual embedding uh and that's pretty much it we kind of went really quickly so i'll be happy to go back and answer like any particular questions about particular things yeah um when you said um vision transformers learns cnn like filters yeah could you elaborate on that uh yes okay so here right uh what i mean by this is sort of uh if you've uh, seen like discussions of resnet you saw right of what the cnns are actually learning and turns out uh, like this is when you do like top principal components and like the projections onto like flattened patches like when you try to put that into lower dimensional space what do you see right like i mean just this image is not very representative but that's what we mean like what are the features it's learning in terms of like the filters uh of like hey these mask edges and all of that well it turns out uh vit also ends up learning some of these so it's very similar to resnet my point here is to highlight that vit is like the transformer equivalent to a uh, resnet so yeah so uh what i mean by that is hey uh it performs slightly better it takes in less uh less uh compute and it does learn similar features like cnns do uh like a resnet does and similar to that like there is some amount of location understanding as well where uh something in the middle is more related to that pixel whereas something at the edge is not yeah where you talk about like why uh VLC is better in terms of task compared to the like, visual and language. So uh like the part where it captures like why uh this the action of the verbs from, yes. you know, like the capture. Yeah, uh let's go there. This one, right? Yeah. Okay. So the basic gist of this Yeah. So uh you see once you get the transformer encoder you have classes right these are for, like you can replace that with some other model but in this case you're doing these class predictions these classes are based on image name so what happens in a vilt architecture is actually you end up using this vit that has been pre-trained on image net classes so uh it's already like technically biased towards image net you can say right because those are the classes it knows whereas an mae structure you're not doing that so uh because essentially you, you're not it's not based on it's not bottlenecked by objects in image net so here that's a claim so here thrown like in terms of coco and all of that you can see that uh sports ball person bas baseball glove are image net classes i mean i think they are i'm not entirely sure but like thrown isn't so actually if you just have built supervised with image net that's uh, that's very important you don't know what throw is whereas vlc because it it's not restricted by the classes actually can understand what 
throw means. Uh, and similar to this, here uh, you have the kite string, right? And in a wilt like setting, I think kite is one of the classes that is in uh, ImageNet. I'm not 100% sure, but it, that's my, I think that's true. So even when I'm trying to see what's the attention on string, it recognizes the kite class more. Whereas VLC actually focuses more on the string. Now, obviously, these are cherry picked examples. It's probably a little bit more nuanced than that, but that's the basic gist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, the DLC was trained also on, on NZ, right? So, there's no free training at all. Uh, I think VLC training might have on. been uh, trained on a pre trained MAE, and then you added text. So I think, yeah, it's not one to one, uh, the like sort of metaphor I'm explaining, but you can sort of think of this as kite string, uh, string, uh, but it, it, you can see it is influenced by the kite label. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I like the claim is that it wouldn't have identified that patch had there not been a kite there. So it, it, it may have, it, it may still be influenced by the kite class per se. Yeah. Any other questions? We, how much time do we have? We have like 15 minutes. Uh, here, yeah, we're predicting visual tokens. Uh, is your question why not just predict pixels? No, sorry, okay. my question is why did we not do the same, uh, like, that's optimization or like mass to the notebook in the input? Uh, so your input yeah. is pixel, right? mm -hmm. so your output is only the, the focal guide. So why did you? So you're saying why is the input not visual tokens? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so is, if you're using the actual image, it might uh, get a better result as opposed to like, let's say you replace the actual image with visual tokens here, and then you sort of do blockwise masking off the visual tokens, and then you sort of do the model there, right? So the visual tokenization of the image is actually not one-to-one. -one. It's not like you're mapping, let's say like, I guess you could say that you're mapping it to an RGB value, but it, it can't encode the entire information. That's an approximation. So here, if you see this is, this code book is, uh, is limited. It's, it's a code book of uh, like similar vectors and these are discrete clusters from encoding. So uh, my guess is if you just have visual tokens and you do the blockwise masking of the tokens and you guess the tokens, that's not gonna give a better, a good output. I'm not hundred percent sure, but like that's my baseline reason. But this is a cool question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, VIT and? Uh, so your VIT yeah. and the other model is, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, VIT is, uh, so, okay. High level, right? VIT wants to predict classes slash predict where the patches are. Whereas MAE is doing a reconstruction based loss. So, um, in that sense, VIT is uh, more task-based 
where you're trying to learn like there are two kinds of losses in VIT, right? One of them is yeah, there are two kinds of losses. Uh, one of them is supervised in in the image to learn the classes, and the other is to force it to learn the position of the patch. So like where in the image is it compared to the rest of the patches. And um, yeah, so that's, it's more a prediction kind of uh, model where essentially, uh, uh, yeah, it's more a prediction kind of model where like it, it's really good at getting like overall just, so like, let's say I'm waving my hand it doesn't care about that if the task is no like identify whether I'm a person or not. Whereas what we're claiming since we're using a masked auto encoder, which generates uh, a lot of information and that lot of information is actually like 70%, which is a lot. So you're worried more about the subtlety. So like the essential thing here is using a generative component you actually end up uh, you actually end up like learning a lot of the subtlety like and what's cool about uh, mae is uh, you don't have to change much about the encoder and decoder like they just put like normal transformer models there it's the technique that makes it better rather than the exact model they're using so like not much had to be changed with the transformer architecture to get good results and it only becomes sharper with more layers and in fact, uh, there's a lot of research now in this area where they're comparing this to GANs because it's doing so well in, re in generating stuff, right? So do you actually need adversarial training to generate stuff is a good question. And uh, just before this lecture, I was looking up uh, CVR 2023 has a new paper, which is like, uh, it's called, uh, uh, so yeah, so now there's, a new class of uh, uh, new class of models called GAN formers, which like adversarially train it to recognize targets. And there's actually a paper which released CVPR 2023, which is like GAN MAE. So instead of just using simple encoder decoder, add add adversarial training to it, and it performs better. So there's like the like when people saw this result, they were very surprised that like it can recreate that much and it helps the air. So another key insight is like, when you're actually doing inference based on this, you don't use the, you, you, you use the entire input. Now you're not using just a subset, right? So when I insert an MAE uh, here in the, in the VLC model, I am taking the entire input. I'm not actually removing chunks per se. Uh, I mean, for training purposes, I am, but like, that's the essential just like it generating is helps it uh, identify things better. Any other question? Um, so maybe in the context of VLC is only as a pre-training procedure for the vision side of things, right? Uh, so it does, uh, so it, yeah, it does, um, uh, image masking as well. So you are, you, you use it as a pre-train and then you actually, I, I think you end up training it as well with the text. So where is the MAE? Exactly? Oh, here, yeah, this is MAE. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'm not 100% sure, but. Cool. Yeah, uh, any other questions? PIT, what happens if we just use a pre-train for Oh, uh, so yeah. So if you use a pre-trained BERT and VIT jointly, uh, you'll have to have this, right? You'll have to align them. So uh, align before fusion. So you use pre-trained, like I'm guessing this is pre-trained, but uh, yeah, it seems to me this is pre-trained. Yeah, yeah. You have to sort of align it. Whereas, and in fact, there, I think there was like some uh, in the paper, they sort of did BERT pre-trained first and then tried adding it and it, it wasn't that great an output. Oh. Yeah, so you can have like permutations and combinations of these things. Yeah. For the position embedding, we use the relative position. So why is that uh, like intuition? Yes, the sort of intuition behind that is, uh, let's get back into this. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so given, let's say, an image patch, if you look at this grid, right, my, uh, given this particular patch, this pixel uh, that is here, or this patch that is here is related to this by being one, one off, right, on the diagonal. In a text setting, it's very clear. Like, it, so you can sort of imagine this is this, right? Text is linear, it, like, in one dimension. So you sort of have, like, you have left and right. Left and right need not be encoded relatively. I mean, you can still sort of say, hey, given a particular position, what's the relative position of this word? And you sort of do it intuitively because you have the overall position. But here, because you're talking about such a large image, uh, ha using the overall position actually, I think, ends up hampering your output. So you do relative position. But that's a good question. I think there must be papers that do it sort of like, uh, sort of having the overall position, but I think having relative helps too. Yeah. Yes. I, I guess maybe it's a bit of like fusion on my end, but uh, it feels like a lot of the initial language approaches effectively feel like ad hoc combination. I, I don't know if you have like a good way to reason about it. this. It's like, hey, I have this thing that works well. So it seems like my work will connectualize it somewhat. Mm -hmm. And I combine it too because, like, yeah. So, uh, how, how do you usually do something about it? Like, what's the higher? Yeah, so that's a great, then only were they able to create MX cert, which is uh, like sort of that adding vision to language kind of side. Uh, but like, you're right. So in terms of overall models, why can't we think of both modalities as like an over engulfing thing rather than trying to combine one modality into the other? And I think the future lectures will cover that. So I think there's a model that, uh, Professor Morenci would cover, which will be one for all. Like, it's sort of like I I'm not sure if that's the exact model, but it's going to cover uh trying to think of these as additions directly. But this is more so in terms of hey, you have a vision model that was pretty good. Let's try adding language. Or your language model that was pretty good. Let's try adding. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think yeah, that's uh, Are there any more questions? So uh, one key thing that I want to mention before we break is uh, in terms of uh, the video uh, transformers, we cover CNN based uh, models here. They've been like, there have been transformer based models in this space as well, which have sort of come up recently. So that's uh, interesting. And I'm pretty sure like, in a few years time, if transformers are as great as people claim they are, we're gonna have more examples of transformer based models in these slides. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, you are free to